these guys 40 minutes to go through the whole uh, the whole series of their their talk. And with that, Vlad and Scott, please introduce yourselves and the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Vlad Grescu. I'm a security engineer at ESNet. And my name is Scott Campbell, and I too am a security engineer at ESNet. Uh, and uh, as Amber mentioned, so you know, the, this first portion is really uh, from a user perspective, why do you care about this? Um, and uh, what are the kind of headline features that you might be interested in running this? Um, and then Scott will kind of delve into some of the, I guess, more of the why of how is this uh, possible? Um, so uh, we're talking about a different way of capturing packets. Uh, there is an Intel library called DPDK. And as part of this, we're releasing um, a Zeek package that um, allows you to use this plugin for, um, uh, yeah, a, as a packet source. Um, and because they're two uh, very closely related presentations, we were just going to uh, do one big Q&A session at the end. Um, so if you're interested in kicking the tires on this after you hear about it, um, it's uh, available um, as of five minutes ago. Um, and, uh, and I think we're excited to have other people give it a shot and see um, what they think. And there's a whole bunch of uh, features that um, is, uh, is a, a good option for uh, future work that will hopefully make it even uh, more valuable to people. So why might you want to run this? Um, so it's something that um, it, it much like Zeek comes with a batteries included box where you spin up Zeek, you maybe run the site local.zeek um, configuration initially, and you're going to get some high quality logs. You know, any of the protocols that it's seeing, um, it's going to be logging those. Some of the policies that don't need a lot of configuration, you're going to be getting notices. So we tried to kind of take that similar approach to this where, you know, maybe uh, you you don't need to be an expert in um, MTU sizes or in the type of traffic that you're seeing or in buffers or interrupts or all those things. Um, and that a lot of these tunings were things that um, you had to do because there was no good way of just having them done automatically for you. So the goal is that, you know, these are sane defaults if you're you know, for whatever reason, if you want to go into um, these, the, the idea is that you can um, have a redef variable or something in your Zeek script that you can um, maybe uh, play with some of those knobs. But um, it's something that for most of the users should just work out of the box. It's something that supports a wide variety of operating systems. So the Intel library DPDK itself will work on Linux, FreeBSD, Windows. Um, it has um, some compatibility layers to make it work well with virtualization, be that Docker, VMware, Hyper-V, um, and then AWS and GCP also have some specific um, things so that the, the hope is that you have one Z configuration, one plugin that you can just use across your, your entire infrastructure. Um, and if that's not appealing enough for you, um, it also seems to be about twice as fast as using the same hardware, the same network card with um, AF packet um, based on our testing. So traditionally when you when we've been doing um, network capture, there have been a few different uh, paths. So a lot of users judging by chat and the mailing lists are looking for commodity network cards, those hundred to two hundred dollar 10 gigabit network cards um, that have uh, you know become uh, very cheap and very available in the past few years. Um, there are some users that um, use kind of more specialized cards that have extra, uh, hardware capacity where they can do a lot of the calculation and hardware. Um, so there's the um, Netronome cards and there, there, there's a whole um, slew of vendors that are happy to sell you um, these cards that have a whole, uh, extra bells and whistles and that do tend to perform better. Um, and then, you know, more recently, some of these specialized cards have started integrating FPGAs. Um, this is something that we've been following. ESNet has a whole project with using FPGAs to look at all the packets coming into the network and tag them and figure out the optimal path for them. So, um, you know, the, this is something that we're following, we're interested in, but um, we've been discovering that for most of our use cases, it's not so much the network card that matters. It's 
um, the CPU that just can't keep up. That there's, um, you know, we we haven't needed to buy 100 gig or 400 gig network cards because we don't have um, the the cores that can handle that. And so we wanted to um, check. I mean, we just wanted to play around with another way of capturing packets and see what we got. So. Traditionally, you know, in the commodity space, the kind of two big options that I see a lot of people talking about are um, Miracom that makes um, the network cards uh, and Intel. And both of these you can use out of the box with uh, libpcap uh, compatible interface. So your TCP dump, Zeek, whatever, um, uh, you know, it, it's very easy to get that up and running. Um, and in the case of Intel, you know, libpcap will work with it, but that's not, um, going to be nearly as performant as some of the other options. So uh, some of the downsides of the Miracom cards are that the driver is closed source. That's a proprietary kernel module. Sometimes there's a kernel update and we need to wait for a version of that driver that'll wait, that'll work with that kernel version. Um, and then uh, it, Intel, um, it can use some of the uh, built-in technologies such as AF packet and XTP. Um, AF Packet, there's a, a great plugin available for it. I think a lot of the community is using this today. Um, the only issue that we've run into it is that it's difficult to get the network card tuned correctly. There's a whole guide to how you want to tune your network card to be able to use it with AF Packet. Um, the knock on XDP is that it doesn't support those jumbo frames, those uh, packets that are larger for whatever reason. Um, and that's kind of a, an inherent limitation to how it uses um, the operating system's memory um, to store it. So um, the kind of uh, third option is um, the Intel data plane development kit. And this is um, really a collection of libraries. It's geared ostensibly towards just sending and receiving packets as fast as possible, but it has a lot of primitives that are useful to you just building your whole application stack up from this. So, um, you know, it does, it has memory buffers and ring buffers. It um, knows about TCP and how to hash those packets, how to classify them. Uh, it can reorder packets that come in um, out of order. It also supports you know, writing PCAP files. It has um, support for multi-process and multi-threading. Uh, it has a rich telemetry framework. And um, the downside of having all this functionality is that's a monster of a, of a uh, library, but um, the documentation is fantastic. The tests are fantastic. They test everything on real hardware. Um, they test everything on the latest kernel. Um, so it's been a, a bit of a steep learning curve, which I think might have been um, why there, why this plugin for Zeek hasn't been around before. Um, but um, really, once you get past that, it's been a, a, an absolute joy to work with, just because all these things are really well designed and built and documented. Um, we have an Ansible script that sets up our Intel cards for AF packet, and this is what it does for us. Um, this uh, is uh, particularly challenging because you know some of these are just booleans that you flip. Um, some of these are uh, depend on the specific model of network of Intel card that you use. Uh, some of these you can only do when the interface is up. Some of these you can only do when the interface is down. Some of these you need to redo if the interface goes up then down. Um, some of these are also dependent on how many workers you have. So if your cluster topology changes, then the um, how you configure your uh, hashing is also going to change. So um, yeah, I think we have like a 600 line Ansible script that um, calculates the right things based on the variables that we set. Um, and, and these are important things to get right, because um, the goal here is that um, for Zeek to really adhere to the fidelity that it was designed to have, the bytes that are coming into your network card need to make it to Zeek, and they need to make it um, kind of as unaltered as possible. So, you know, some of these things might um, disable the fact that if you if your network card gets many small uh, packets in a row, it's much easier for Zeek to just get one large packet and process that process that once, and so. You know, out of the box, Intel is going to the the NIC is going to try to help you out um, and reassemble those for you and save some CPU time. The downside is that that um, opens you up to evasion attacks. It opens you up to what's on the wire not matching what you're actually seeing in the Zeek logs. And that fidelity of the data is what we're trying to maintain first and foremost. And as we maintain that, then we're trying to figure out how we can 
do it in a performant way. Um, so compared to that previous list, in order to use DPDK, you do something like this, where you, there are some packages that you install. DPDK has been around a long time, and there's good support for it inside of um, the common Linux distributions. So there you can generally find packages that you need um, for it. Um, and then it's not in, uh, I haven't submitted it upstream to the, the, Zeek, the Zeek package manager yet, but you'll install the DBDK plugin, you'll mod probe um, your, uh, your network driver, um, either at runtime or you can set this at boot so you don't have to worry about it. You need to reserve some memory space um, for this, uh, for where the packets are going to be queued essentially. And then you basically tell your operating system, you know, here's my network card. It, it goes by PCI bus IDs. Um, and you tell the kernel, you don't have to worry about this one anymore. We're going to do something else with it. So, you know, this is kind of the, the status of things before we start messing around with DPDK. Um, and it will tell you, you know, here's the interface name, here's the current driver. I think it'll even tell you, like, this one's active and it'll prevent you from trying to unbind your. Uh, network car that you're running SSH on, not that we've ever been bitten by that before, but it'll tell you that, it'll tell you what drivers uh, that network card supports. And then you basically just, uh, it comes with this little helper Python script that will bind a given PCI address to a given driver. And at this point, it's now invisible to the operating system um, and DPDK knows about it. And you start up Zeek, you tell it to, this uh, tells it to use the DPDK plugin and the DPDK plugin will look to see what uh, network uh, ports you have bound to a DPDK aware driver. So you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to worry about interface names or anything like that. It'll just find a network port for you. And that's pretty much it. So what happens behind the scenes is a fair amount of things, right? So. Um, people might be using task set to pin your Zeek process to a specific CPU. And ideally that CPU is close to the PCI card that you're using to make it perform better. Um, so DPDK handles that for you. It, it's aware of that architecture. It will find a CPU for you that matches. Um, the Zeek plugin, you know, you don't need to specify how many workers you have on that system because why should you? The plugin can read your cluster configuration and it can figure that out automatically. It'll set up the hashing automatically for you based on that. It'll set up a few different things. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, the DPA auto will just find a network a NIC port with the, uh, the correct driver. Um, you don't need to worry about setting the MTU. It'll just figure out what the maximum for that particular NIC is and set it to that maximum. So the trade-off here is it might use a little bit of extra memory um, for uh, queuing up uh, those packets, but we're talking you know, on the order of megabytes. And um, again, this is something that maybe will eventually get exposed and users can, can mess with it. But I, I wanted to start from a, a stance of, um, I want to make it really hard for people to shoot themselves in the foot rather than you need to know the secret incantation to avoid shooting yourself in the foot. So uh, it'll figure out the maximum and just go from there. Um, DPDK, because it's designed to uh, for these network applications, it will go through and disable most of the offloading that we previously discussed. Um, you don't need to worry about IRQs and anything like that because one of the performance benefits of uh, those DPDK aware drivers is that they don't actually use interrupts to single to, to signal to the CPU because that burns valuable um, clock cycles. And instead, uh, the CPU, their, your process will just periodically ask the driver of, okay, give me whatever packets you have available. Um, and finally, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, turning off LODP or IPv6 link local or anything that prevents you from accidentally sending traffic out your monitoring interface because as we discussed, the OS is, you, you can't see the interface, it, it's not there as far as it's concerned. Um, so we talked a lot about the Intel NICs, that's the ones that we like because as I mentioned, they're, they're cheap, they seem to be working really well for us, but DPDK comes with support for about 50 different NIC drivers. Um, Obviously, Intel is a big player, but Netronome, Napatek, some of those uh, kind of more specialized uh, NIC drivers, they will work just as well. Um, Miracom is the one example that we've discussed so far that does not play well with DPDK, but you know, 
sure would be great if it would support it uh, someday. Uh, and then you can kind of just use the DPDK plugin and swap out the driver depending on what you bind to it um, behind the scenes. So um, with that, I guess I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to Scott for the second half of this. And as I mentioned, we'll do a, a combined Q&A at the end. All right, hello. Um, so I am Scott, and I'm going to talk about kind of our our journey there and back again, um, and some of the technical details about what we did. I mean, Vlad got to give you all of the good news, and so I'll kind of talk about the rest of it. Oops. All right. So let me move something that's sitting rudely in the way. DBDK, uh, what's, what are we going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to talk about briefly what is the big deal about getting line rate packets. Um, just a couple of slides on that. And then kind of like how we made it go and some performance numbers uh, around it. And then where our path forward is as far as what we would like to be doing. So what is it about packets? You know, why is this such a big deal? Um, well, obviously there are so many of them and that's kind of obviously part of the problem, but to just kind of start the conversation, we're going to take a really manageable, normal 10 gig per second uh, stream, you know, just nothing too extraordinary, not 100 gig, not, you know, and so we're going to look at the average time between packets, um, assuming they are well-behaved packets, and as I point out here, there are no well-behaved packets. Um, when packets move in groups, they tend to clump and do other weird things. But we're just going to, for the purposes of this, just assume everything is well behaved and equally spaced. So looking at, I'm not going to read this table because it's not super interesting, but really the idea is to point out how long you have to handle a packet, you know, before the next one shows up. And if you only have one core and you are dealing with 10 gig per second, you have like 0 0.05 microsecond or 128 clock cycles. And, and that's basically nothing. Um, you'll never do that. So we took a look at a 64 core box because that's, you know, obviously the big ones are fun. And you end up with a lot more time per packet. You know, in this case, figured maybe 256 bytes average. So you've got about 12.8 microseconds, which is better. So that's kind of like your time budget. That's how much time you have to do stuff. So in today's economy, what can 12.8 microseconds get you? Um, memory access isn't too bad. Um, as Vlad suggested, if you're sitting on a NUMA node, you want to touch memory local to you because it's way faster than wandering across and having to touch memory outside of the cache. Um, looking at a nice fast SSID, that will destroy you utterly. So obviously we don't wanna to touch the disk. And um, Vlad did a little work on this and the times that it takes for Zeek to process each of these packets varies between you know 3.5 and 11K microseconds with the average of being um, 31. So that's kind of the number we're gonna use, but given the fact that you have 12.8, you, you, know, you may stop and go, well, how does that work? How can I see anything at all? And um, really the, the use of these average numbers is kind of inappropriate because of the fact that um, it's not a nice even distribution and there's queuing and traffic is bursty, there's time enough to get things done. Um, so Zeke does in fact manage to process most of this, but um, we still want to make it easier to get packets to Zeke. And so we wanna um, address that. That's what, you know, that's kind of the point of the driver. And this slide is all about a, just an amazing error that I saw and I said, I'm going to make a slide out of that. Um, like a couple of months ago, and here it is. Um, so that was the MTU that got reported back. And this is what happens when you um, 
start poking around in kernel drivers is you get a lot of really weird errors. Um, that's all. So some options, you know, Vlad talked about um, some of them. I'm going to do a super quick summary of um, three of them, kind of like the classic AF packet three. There is an AF packet four, which is um, based on XDP, but I'm not going to touch that here because I talk about XDP. So I talk about the classic AF packet, then DPDK, and then XDP. And this isn't a, uh, this is the best overall. Each of these does something really well. And depending on what purpose you need, you know, there's usually one that stands out as being ideal. You know, AF packet, it lives in the kernel as a driver. It it is interrupt driven. So it, you know, it's like it just sits around and waits for the for the NIC to yell when the NIC has packets. You know, something really good things about it, it's just ubiquitous. It's everywhere, it's built in, it's awesome, but it's kind of slow. And it does require a lot of tuning, as Vlad pointed out. DPDK lives before the kernel. So as was suggested, when you invoke it, the interface just disappears. You have no kernel space tools to handle the data flow. And so everything that has to live in user space. And so, you know, that's one of the bad things and I'll get to. Uh, it, it uses polling. So um, the driver asks the NIC instead of the NIC telling the driver. Good thing is obviously it's very fast. It's the fastest of the three. And the bad thing, as I suggested, is the kernel has, you know, you lose a lot of uh, infrastructure with regard to like packet handling. And XDP, it lives in the kernel, but it sits kind of really, you know, kind of, it, it's shallow in the kernel in that um, it gets to handle the packets before the kernel does any SKB memory allocation or anything. So um, it's pretty fast because a lot of code just doesn't get run. You can run it either as interrupt or polling. Um, it is really fast and it's a bit more flexible than DPDK, unless you really feel like building a bunch of tools. Um, some of the bad things, you know, as I suggested, uh, jumbo packets are a problem and you, you lose some visibility in tooling. Um, you know, you can't run TCP dump and see what's going on, just as an example. But um, other than that, you know, DPDK and XDP are both really interesting new useful uh, technologies. So just really quick, some of the basic things we had to plow through. Um, it seems bizarre that uh, it's still a problem, but RSS is a continuing irritant in the community. I don't know why it has to be as hard as it is, but it is. Um, so that was that took a bit of time. Um, figuring out how to effectively communicate configuration information between Zeek and the DPK driver. Um, that took a couple of days, but ultimately that wasn't a real big problem. And then just kind of we bumped into a few strange things. Um, I just call out find ready sources because it was a source of um, tremendous hilarity during uh, development. So the test setup we did, um, we had a, a packet source, which we, it's like its role in life is to just, you know, yeet packets out onto the wire as fast as it can. And it gets handed off to an Arista switch. And there's two as closely identical boxes as we could make, given the fact that no one lives near them and we are all enjoying the pandemic. Um, the specifications for the boxes are there. Probably the most interesting thing was just that we used uh, Intel 710 um, because it's a really, you know, it's a, as suggested, it's a really nice cheap card that does an amazing variety of things um, if you just know how to ask it. And it's it's not always easy to know how to ask it. So the first time we built the driver, or rather, let me make this clear. When I say we, I mean Vlad, because he's the brains behind all of this. Um, we run it just, you know, what happens, right? You know, and so there's no expectation that the systems will be able to handle all 10 million packets that they're going to see. And obviously they don't. But um, we were pleasantly surprised that uh, the DPDK driver, um, the Zeek driven by DPDK, um, still you know, saw about 50% more packets. Um, 
in this case, there was some RSS issues and um, it wasn't clear or clean or happy, but it did work better. And we were really, uh, really pleased about that. And it worked a lot better than we thought it would. So looking at the kind of like flame graph representation of where all the work is going, you know, it, it was really disappointing in that, you know, Zeke was only only using about 25% of the CPU time. And that's not what you want. That's the opposite line of what you want. And then there is this, you know, as I mentioned before, there was this, this function, this find ready sources, which was um, taking all of this time that uh, and so we had to figure out what is this and how can we make it go away and so we did a bit of work um and the data well i guess take a step back um the data path that we are using is in the initial driver build um it was super naive it was really linear it was you know just kind of a run loop hands it to dpdk dpdk um kind of gathers up the packets and then hands it to Zeke that dispatches them one at a time. Um, and so it's kind of, there's no optimizations and um, about 2.8 out of the 10 million packets were received and processed by Zeke, which is, you know, better than we had with AF packet, but it's still, you know, obviously there's a lot of improvement that can happen. The first big fix is, um, we looked at the fact that the NIC only has uh, 4K queues available to handle packets. So if you know if you see a, if you get a burst of packets, you probably won't be able to um, offload them off of the NIC queue before um, it gets overrun. And so we broke up uh, pulling packets off of the queue into a buffer and taking packets from this buffer and handing them off to Zeke. And that way you at least have like this uh, spongy memory buffer that you can, that is a whole lot bigger than 4K that can soak up um, spikes in traffic. And so this worked really well. This is kind of a classic um, design paradigm of dealing with this uh, very problem, which is why we did it. And it worked really well. And so we did a few other things. Um, and because we don't have a huge amount of time, I wasn't going to kind of iterate through them. But a later run that used instead of just, you know, the packet generator working out 10 million packets and stopping, it looped over it. And so that gives it a little bit better feel for um, how it works in the longer run. Uh, the, you can see just kind of basically how things worked here. The DPDK ended up handing off. Uh, almost two times the number of packets that the AF packet um, driver did, which made us super happy. Um, things were working very good. And the same uh, flame graph mechanism is here. And it looks a lot healthier. This is kind of a snippet of it. There's kind of a tail off to the right where um, non-Zeke things happen. But um, Zeke is using way more of this, you know, instead of being this one little pokey spike, it uh, it's this big fat consumer of CPU, which is exactly what you want. And so we fixed a bunch of problems, um, particularly find ready sources, and uh, we were very happy. The last couple of slides, um, I have been coding for a really long time and I'm used to kind of clunking along in VI. And using DPDK, not only was their documentation absolutely spectacular, but um, it comes with a whole slew of modern tools about, you know, kind of performance tuning and where are the problems. And it really helps you out, just walks you along. And they're quite kind of spectacular. Um, and this is just an example of it. You know, it basically points out you're wasting 3.8% of your total time in this one function call. Maybe do something about it. And we did something about it. And performance increased by 4%, which may not seem like a lot, but those things really add up fast. And um, we're super happy. 
we were not always super happy because the modern tools also yelled at us. They're like, you know, you're you're screwing up here and you're screwing up there. But it, I mean, that's super useful. And um, it really gives you a feel for where some of the pinch points are. We have not had an opportunity to really um, affect change using all of this because uh, we just haven't had the time. We really started this project in the beginning of August and um, it's kind of a side project for all of us. So uh, it has not seen the, the time and love that it requires, but even with that, it's, it's really doing, um, we're really happy with how things are going. As far as like where we wanna go, future work, all of that, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do. Um, one of the first things we're going to do is the the BPF filter that you can Zeek when you when you fire it up. That can happen on the NIC, um, and so obviously that seems like a really easy, straightforward thing to do. So that's one of the first things we're going to do. Um, shunting. I do a. Um, I've done a whole bunch of work with um, high performance clusters, and shunting is awesome because it moves. You know, there's gigantic flows that you're super not interested in seeing. Um, that can happen on the NIC in this case, which will, you know, for a whole cluster in a box kind of situation is perfect. And interacting with the NIC is alarmingly fast and um, doesn't require even wandering through a, a socket call or anything. So um, doing high speed shunting should not be a problem at all. And then Looking back at some of the, the interesting things that Vlad found as far as how long it takes to chew on a packet within Zeek, um, that's definitely something that we're going to kind of study a little bit more carefully because it seems like you could affect cluster, you know, you can kind of optimize your cluster architecture depending on which, you know, if you have a fast path or a slow path, and then you can do that kind of selective packet routing based on timing and maybe get a bit more um, performance out of your system as a whole because you can um, optimize collectively. So as was suggested, if you are looking for adventure, we are looking for people to help test us this out. Um, it is a very green thing. You should not attach your production cluster to it. You should not attach your iron lung to it, but um, it would be really cool to get some feedback. And that's it. Um, both Vlad and I are available now for questions. It looks like we have about six minutes left in the, on the, uh, the time, which is perfect. Scott and Vlad, thank you so much. It looks like there are some questions in your Slack channel. So if one of you guys wants to uh, reread those questions and answer for the next six minutes we can do that if you'd rather answer them in the channel we can do that or i could just ask you guys interesting questions because i have a ton queued up for the two of you so okay i don't uh why don't you ask us because i don't have the channel handy okay well, unless Vlad does i do um and there, there is one question that i kind of already answered in in slack of why did we go down this path because um, I, I, I think in, in some, in, in some uh, tangential areas, we've been hearing about DPDK and a lot of work has gone into that uh, in the past several years and just kind of curious to see what we could do with it. And it sounded challenging. Um, it also, I also saw a couple of questions in um, the YouTube channel, I thought. But now I'm not seeing those anymore. So hopefully I disabled those comments, uh, so, so we wouldn't have to watch multiple places. But um, okay. I didn't see any. But it's hard to see the timestamps, so I wasn't sure who they were for. Gotcha. I don't see any more question. Um, there is another one. Um, yeah, so the question is if missing packets means that Zeek uh, may miss some attack payloads. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think I'd even go a little bit further in saying that um, 
because Zeek needs to track the state and follow things carefully, it's fairly sensitive to missing packets. So if it's TCP and there's a gap, um, it assumes that it can't kind of faithfully know um, what's been happening. So a lot of the TCP based protocol analyzers will kind of just give up if there's a significant content gap and if they miss uh, data. I'm not seeing any other questions. Do you, since we are going into lunch after this presentation, we'll have about a, a 30 minute break. Uh, and I'll tell you all, thank you uh, so much for presenting this and, and sharing it with the community and for the call to action. It's really important um, that people know that most of the time when you all or anyone else, you know, is sharing something, there is always a call to action and always, uh, you know, something that people can do to help improve whatever anybody's working on. Is there, because both of you have been long time um, contributors and participants in the Zeke community um, and, and seeing the work that, that you've both done historically and even now, what what's a couple things that you would um, really encourage the community to look at and get started that maybe you didn't know at the very beginning, but you wish somebody had told you now? Or, you know, if you were starting now, you wish somebody would have told you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, for our plugin in particular, but also for Zeek as a whole, um, file GitHub issues for the, the problems that you see or the things that you want, that uh, the functionality that's missing, that, um, you know, there, there are a lot of micro decisions made along the way of whether or not people wanted this feature or not. Um, and many of those will, were quite possibly wrong. Um, so if there's something missing, um, then, you know, open up a GitHub issue and, um, you know, someone might help you uh, figure out a way to kind of contribute and learn. That's how I got into deeper into the Zeek project. There was stuff that I fundamentally wanted to be a better security professional using this tool. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to get help and was able to add some of those um, features myself. Um, and, you know, that's what I think we're, we'd, we'd love to hear that, um, like I said, this library, this capability um, is uh, so vast. Um, and I, I want to hear how people want to use it and what's missing or what they're, um, yeah, what, what else they want to see it do. Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, just, you know, two things. One is don't be afraid to just play around with it and, you know, turn on all, you know, obviously not in your production environment, but, you know, have a play around with it. Uh, it's really does a lot of amazing things. A lot of really awesome folks have done a ton of work. Um, so play with Zeke. Um, and the other thing, you know, as, as Vlad suggested, uh, don't be shy about the community. It's really, it's an alarmingly friendly group of people. And um, that's really helpful as far as uh, welcoming folks in and just asking questions. Even if you think it's a silly question, it might actually not be. You know, both, both of you all, you know, I've met, I've met each of you at different events. Uh, I think it was in Portland, maybe where I met, met you, Scott, or somewhere on the West Coast. But, and, and Vlad, I've met you at a couple different, um, you know, community events and things and both given me really great feedback. But we did have a question and some of the community folks were wondering, especially from users like yourself, is there something that you would change about Zeek or a feature that you would add that um, is not available yet? I, I feel like I pass people pretty often on the discussions list or the GitHub issues with my crazy ideas, but th those don't get added because they're fundamentally difficult um, and quite possibly wrong. So. Well, what are some of those ideas? Uh, you know, a lot of people that are watching this feed and hearing us chit chat, you know, maybe they're not familiar with, you know, GitHub issues or, or the conversations or, or, you know, Git is not part of their workflow because they're not necessarily developers and users. So what what are, maybe you can throw some of your ideas out and see if it gains traction. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I am interested to see where this integration with DPK goes that, um, you know, in order to make this a plugin, it needs to fit into the plugin framework, which means that uh, it, it's very clearly structured and defined for how that works. But I think some of the real interesting uh, benefits are being able to offload a lot of this, where maybe, you know, Zeke, one day Zeke doesn't need to worry about getting SIN packets and the network card can just handle that and just kind of relay the metadata that Zeke does care about. So um, I think, you know, figuring out what that looks like, figuring out a, a tighter integration would really unlock a lot of extra capabilities that are exciting and would allow us to use more of the uh, DPDK library. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at, I mean, Zeek is a really awesome tool. Um, obviously, it's not, you know, the uh, it doesn't do all the things. And one of the things that it uh, doesn't do super well, which is totally okay, is that um, like the data, the analysis side of things, kind of taking either discrete data or aggregate data and doing kind of summaries and trends and whatnot. So having a slight, having a little bit better way of getting access um, to that data in a programmatic way might be kind of handy. Um, because it, it's kind of, you know, you don't, you don't want to build that intelligence into Zeek because that's kind of like recreating the wheel. And so finding a better way to integrate Zeek into known good quantities with that would be kind of cool. Just a, an example. I appreciate those examples. What, you know, I'm, I don't know if you all have seen uh, Ashish's talk that he gave maybe six months ago. And again, this time continuum on the, in the pandemic is, is a bit, um, you know, I can't, time just runs together. But um, he, he gave a, a slight uh, talk about the top 10 things he wished someone would have told him when he got started. And then it turned into a list of 15 things the more he thought about it. And he kind of kept going. It was amazing. Um, what, what is something that you all, each of you, with it, one, what's the one thing that you wish you'd known when you got started that somebody would have told you? And two, what's been the, the most painful lesson you've learned while, um, you know, using Zeke? You want to start, Scott? So much pain. Um, I, I think, I mean, of all the lessons to tell people, I think the, the most important one is to, I don't know, just, I don't want to say relax. You're never going to get everything. You're never going to understand everything. Nobody does. And to kind of, not internalize the idea that you have to is is really important because otherwise you'll spend your entire life trying to do all the things and then you won't end up doing much of anything and so i think if i you know talking to a young analyst i think that would be a really important thing to stress is just because you know it can be done or can be learned doesn't mean that it would be healthy to try to learn all of them and as far as like painful things, so many things I have done have been just terrible ideas. Um, needlessly introducing complexity, I think, is a, a problem I had for a number of years um, as far as uh, either trying to build things into Zeek or trying to build architectures. So I guess this is kind of a meta statement that um, complexity is not good. And if you are making something that is really complicated, you are probably doing it wrong. And um, so that's, you know, I rather than a specific example of pain, that is a lesson uh, brought to you by pain. And so, yeah, that's all. Well, what about you? Yeah. I, I think that's good advice. I think, um, you know, kind of, kind of what it took me several years to figure out is that um, while it might feel that way, there's nothing inherently magic about this. And that, you know, I can 
search through GitHub, I can find uh, where something happens. And generally, the, the code base is um, you know, so rich that I, if I don't know how to add a feature, I can find an example of a similar feature that's very, very close. And so I can at least take a you know, sh shot in the dark at it and then have somebody who knows better than me tell me how to actually do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that um, it, 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 it might seem daunting, it might seem uh, difficult to do, but I think the, the best issues, the best pull requests that I see um, have actual code attached. And um, I think there's a whole community of people that are willing to help kind of get people up to speed and get people um, and get more people contributing, even if that's, you know, a one or two line change to something. Um, in some of the contributions that I did were literally spinning up virtual machines with every version of Windows I could get my hand around and or a hand on and um, seeing what their net network traffic looked like so that Zeke could identify Windows versions that there. Um, I mean, some of this just takes kind of perseverance and work. Um, and, you know, similar to this, it's not a very really large plugin. Um, and it just took lots and lots of kind of brute forcing and, um, and, and so we figured out how to get it to work, but, um, well, I appreciate you humoring me with some questions that folks, uh, you know, can always learn from. And one of the things that after these kind of impromptu, uh, questions and, and answer sessions is people message me and say, Thank you, because these are experts and we know these names and we recognize these names from around the community. And by them sharing that there's something they just learned, it helps me understand that everybody's human and, and this takes a while and helps them relax. So your advice is very welcomed by the community because there's new folks every day who come in and they're nervous and they don't want to mess up something. They don't want to break anything. But when they hear you all and your lessons and things that you've learned, they relax a little bit more. So I think it's right in line with the advice that you're giving folks. Relax, it'll all come, you'll get it, and then you'll learn every day. So I appreciate you all um, giving your words of wisdom to the community. And with that, you all uh, probably want to take a lunch break too. We all start back in about 20 minutes. So um, everybody go get some food, go get some uh, drinks, stretch, and we will be back at the bottom of the hour. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amber.